The 19th century was a period of enormous growth and change worldwide. In the United States, the Industrial Revolution transformed the nation from an agricultural backwater to a country of growing metropolises, as railroads and steamboats and more transferred really the very nature of life as humans knew it. It was also a period of the rise of financial markets like Wall Street, when often using unscrupulous tactics, money managers and stockbrokers could make fortunes overnight and lose them almost as quickly. This was the world of Cornelius Vanderbilt and infamous robber barons like Jay Gould and Diamond Jim Fisk. And right alongside them, and just as active a financier, was an illiterate cattle drover who, using underhanded tactics, made millions on Wall Street, although he is nearly forgotten. The story of Daniel Drew, a villain of Wall Street, deserves to be remembered. Daniel Drew was born on July 29, 1797, on a rural farm about 50 miles north of New York City, near the town of Carmel. Daniel had little in the way of education, but he did get swept up in the Second Great Awakening by a Methodist revival. His father died in 1812, and Daniel served as a substitute for another in the draft during the War of 1812, though he saw no combat. But now he had a taste of the world beyond the rural farm, and he had a plan. I want my substitute money, he announced one day. I'm going to buy cattle and sell them in New York. The growth of cities is what made the drover necessary. Cities like New York needed more food than they can get from the lands nearby, so drovers would find cattle far afield and drive them into the city to sell. Nineteen and as much of a country bumpkin as anyone could have found, Daniel probably started with small groups of cattle and lambs and worked his way up. By tradition, one of Drew's most famous cons was when he tricked Henry Astor, elder brother of the famous magnate John Jacob Astor. Supposedly, Drew fed his cows salt until they were desperate of thirst, and then let them drink just before sale. The cows put on as much as 50 pounds of water weight, and Astor bought the whole lot at three cents a pound. That story was the legendary origin of the Wall Street term watered stock, but it actually probably didn't happen. Drew had a good reputation with butchers, who trusted him enough to allow him to become the proprietor of the Bull's Head Tavern at the cattle market. Instead, watered stock seems to have become an adage first, and was attributed to Drew later. Owning the Bull's Head made Drew king of the drovers. Drew was a mediator of sales at the Bull's Head and began banking services too, handling the cash of the drovers and the butcher alike for a fee. He became a wealthy man, though barely literate. He epitomized the American dream of rags to riches. But he hungered for more. He would later say that people don't understand me. They think that I love money. I tell you, Brother Parker, it ain't so. I must have excitement, or I should die. He moved into the city and got involved with steamboats, beginning in 1831. This brought him into his first competition with Cornelius Vanderbilt. Drew gained control of the Hudson River Steamboat Association and eventually formed his People's Line, which he would run successfully for most of his life. His boats were lavish, dubbed floating palaces. In the late 1830s, Drew turned to Wall Street. In the wake of the Panic of 1837, he bought up paper money that had been issued by banks that other banks refused to honor. He held them until he could sell them for a profit. He started a firm and got his foot in the door as an insider in the New York Stock and Exchange Board. He began speculating, as he called it. He was a bear and mostly shorted stocks, borrowing shares of a stock he thought would decrease in value. He promises to buy the stocks back at a later date, and if the price of the stock is lower at that later date, he made a profit. The game was played with all kinds of false tips and rumors, with the ultimate goal being to corner the market, that is, buy up all the floating shares, so that when people shorting the stocks had to buy back the stocks, they paid more rather than less than they had originally. Even more complexities could make the game dangerous, a potential to make a fortune, or to lose one. Drew took on all manner of nicknames, especially Uncle Drew, but also Old Man, Ursa Major, and the Deacon. Drew also wanted to control companies, not just trade stock. With Vanderbilt and more, he got his first controlling interest in a railroad in 1846. Connecting his rail line with his boats, he could promise greater profits. He began long-standing battles over rail lines, which pulled businesses away from steamboats, making deals, getting put on boards, and adapting to new circumstances. In 1853, he joined the board of the New York and Erie Railroad, a line that would take up much of his time for the next 15 years. Drew's interest was not really in running a railroad, but becoming an insider to the stock's fluctuations. His stock jobbing didn't stop him from being religious, and he donated large amounts of money to Methodist schools, including Wesleyan, and helped found the Drew Theological Seminary, now Drew University, in New Jersey. He insisted that all I am that is worth anything to the world I owe to the Methodist Episcopal Church under God. He was never well read, spoke roughly with poor grammar, 
At one point, his clerks needed to get into his office safe, but they couldn't open it. He told them the code was door, an ordinary house door, barn door, stable door, any kind of door. But they still couldn't open the safe. And besides, it was a five-letter combination, not four. When Drew finally came to the office, he opened it at once. There, it opens as easy as an old sack. Just D-O-A-R-E. Despite his poor learning and spelling, he kept nearly all of his financial transactions only in his head, but recalled them accurately, even shortly before his death. Daniel Drew first met Jim Fisk when Fisk offered to handle the sale of some of his steamboats in 1864. Fisk was new to Wall Street then, but was a quick learner and unscrupulous. With Jay Gould, a man similarly unbothered by conscience, a trio was formed ready to make more millions in speculation. In 1859, the New York and Erie Railroad had finally defaulted on its mortgages, and by 1861, exited receivership and was reorganized simply as the Erie Railway Company, with Drew on the board. Drew made millions, manipulating the stock. He would short the company's stock, and then, as he did in 1864, announce in his homespun English that them Erie shears a shellin' now for a little more money than they're worth. The stock price plummeted, and his shorts made a killing. Over and over, Drew would manipulate the stock to his own advantage, and men who bet against him, and often with him, as his whims changed, lost fortunes. The unscrupulous manner in which this stock is being played with on the stock exchange is a disgrace to American railway management, the New York Herald declared. All this was going on as the Civil War ended and President Lincoln was assassinated, because speculating stopped for no one. Meanwhile, Cornelius Vanderbilt had begun building a railroad empire, and with three lines owned, he turned his eyes on Drew's Erie. Vanderbilt succeeded in seizing the board, but Drew managed to ingratiate himself with the promise that his speculation was over. Vanderbilt allowed him to remain on the board, along with new faces, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk. Drew wasn't about to sit quietly while his railroad was taken, either. Instead of cooperating with Vanderbilt's other railroads, Drew positioned the Erie to compete with them. Vanderbilt wasn't going to take it sitting down either, and thus started the Great Erie War. Vanderbilt aimed to buy up Erie stock and corner Drew. Court injunctions were aimed at Drew to prevent him from selling stock or running the board. Drew, Gould, and Fisk's plan was dubiously legal. Law prevented the railroad from increasing their capitalization by directly issuing stock, but they could raise money using convertible bonds for construction purposes, which could be turned into stock. 100,000 new shares of these convertible bonds were printed. This was in practice the watered stock technique, issuing falsified certificates or releasing them without authorization. The stocks would relieve Vanderbilt of seven or eight million dollars as he continued to buy. Half the bonds were issued as stocks first. Vanderbilt got another injunction which banned the Erie from issuing any kind of stock and banned Drew from all Erie transactions. Drew had already shorted the stocks and Vanderbilt hoped to drive up the price of stock. Now, he thought, Drew could do nothing about it. But Vanderbilt was wrong. Drew found a different Supreme Court judge to issue an injunction against Vanderbilt's man on the board. Drew still had $5 million worth of convertible bonds, but was barred from doing anything with them, so Drew found a third party to buy the bonds and hand them over to Drew's personal control. When the railroad had the certificates printed and already made out to Fisk and Gould's brokerage, a clerk transforming them reported that Fisk had appeared out of nowhere, grabbed the certificates, and ran. While legal wrangling continued, Drew began to sell eerie stocks. People around the country began paying attention in the papers, crowding out even reports of Andrew Johnson's impeachment. When word broke of the new stock, Vanderbilt's allies fled, selling their own stocks. Erie plummeted. Vanderbilt had to take loans, but he bought every share that came out. But the trio weren't done. They pulled out $7 million in cash from circulation, which forced banks to call in loans. Vanderbilt and the like needed loans to cover their purchases, and loans were suddenly very hard to get. Rumors swirled that Vanderbilt was close to ruin. Vanderbilt was only able to obtain loans by threatening the banks on their own stocks in other rails, which would break half the houses on the street. Vanderbilt's judge issued orders of contempt, planning on putting 70-year-old Drew and his compatriots in jail. So Drew, along with Gould, Fisk, $7 million in cash and the company's books, fled the city for Jersey. There they holed up in Taylor's Hotel in Jersey City. Fort Taylor, as it was dubbed. Tufts from New York crossed the city, seeking Drew and the others because $50,000 had been offered if they could be forced back to New York. Jersey police surrounded the hotel. Men with Springfield rifles sailed in small boats on the river. Vanderbilt, however, may never have sent these men. In fact, Fisk may have organized the drama himself for public relations. The fight moved to Albany, where a lobbying of all kinds fought to pass a bill that would make Drew's actions legal. Gould himself slipped to New York to finance the bribes. Ultimately, a bill was passed that legalized the scheme as long as money from those bonds was actually used to improve the railroad. Then Drew went behind everyone's back to meet with Vanderbilt, hoping to arrange a deal. 
Fisk and Gould felt betrayed. Finally, a settlement was reached between Vanderbilt and the others, and the suits were dropped. Gould and Fisk negotiated with Vanderbilt alone, promising to buy back most of the Erie shares. Drew resigned from the board, and $9 million was paid out to various parties, all that they had taken from Vanderbilt and more. Drew stepped mostly out of Wall Street, but was still involved in an effort to strangle the currency supply with Gould and Fisk in 1868 and lost $1.4 million in a failed attempt to short-sell Erie again. Fisk was shot dead by a man whose reputation he had ruined. The Panic of 1873 nearly ruined Drew, and he was 76 and ailing. Failure after failure drove him to bankruptcy in 1876. His creditors hounded him, but eventually agreed that he had nothing left to give. He ended up living on his son's farm, not far from where he was born. But even penniless, he would still sometimes show up on Wall Street, just to reminisce. He died suddenly of a cerebral apoplexy in 1879 at the age of 82, and at the time of his death, his estate was valued at $148.22. Opinions abound as to whether he was a good man or a bad man. He was certainly known for being pious, but in 1910, an angry preacher wrote a biography of him that was purportedly taken from his own diary that cemented his reputation as a Wall Street villain, even though the book turned out to be entirely a fabrication. What he really was, was an example of the frantic speculation and corruption of the latter part of the 19th century, although Wall Street shenanigans are hardly limited to just that period. But you have to admit, in a time of giants, he stood both beside and fought the likes of Cornelius Vanderbilt and robber barons like Jim Fisk and Jay Gould. From almost nothing, he made millions of dollars, only to wind up pretty much where he started. As his biographer later said of him, he was a man of contradictions, who, having fooled others his entire life, ended up fooling himself. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.